And now, here's Dan with today's lesson. Anyone who does not have a syllabus, hold up your hand if you would, and we'll be sure to get you one. Oh, a lot of you need a syllabus. Those of you who already have them, if you look, turn to the last page, it's a map of Paul's missionary journeys. It's going to be a confusing map unless I help you here a little bit. Uh, the area of water should be in blue, obviously, or some other color, but it isn't. Right through the middle of your map, at kind of an angle, you'll see two words, mare internum. Do you see that? Just right down there, Mediterranean Sea. Mare means sea. And uh, still some folks over here, we're going to get you one. Yes. Mare is sea, and uh, it's the Mediterranean Sea. So Crete, you see right there in the middle, is an island. Looking straight north of Crete, you will see uh, Greece. A little bit farther left, you will see uh, Italy. See the boot sticking down there? It's on this end of the map, that little boot. Italy's called the little boot. It says Mare Adriaticum. That's the Adriatic Sea. <laughs> and over here, there's another sea. This is the Aegean Sea. This is where the island of Patmos is and so forth. It's not a good map, but the good maps are very hard to find unless you have to pay a fortune for them. We'll work on that. But I wanted you to see that because that's the missions journeys of Paul. And the legend down here to help you is if it's dot, 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 that's Paul's first missionary journey, which starts out over on this end of the page at Antioch. And you can follow it. It goes down to Cyprus and then up into the underbelly of Turkey and then back around and so forth. It actually left from the port city of Seleucia, which is explained in your syllabus today. Then the dash, 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 dash is the second missionary journey. The continuum line is the third missionary journey, and the heaviest line you see that goes right across the middle was his last journey on the way up to Rome to stand before Nero. I wanted to explain that to you, otherwise it's going to be a little bit confusing. A picture is worth a thousand words. I'd rather have books with pictures in them than without. I love pictures. And I think to help get us started tonight, I'm going to take you over to Israel for about ten minutes. Uh, it just helps. The book of Acts begins at the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take you back for just a few minutes to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has two parts to it. The new city, which is just as modern as Fort Myers, really, just about. And then there's the old city that's contained inside the great walls. Those are not the original walls. They're somewhat built on the site of the old ones, except for the south end. But the walls you see now are about 500 years old and uh, were built by the great uh, Turk Suleiman back in the uh, 15th century. But uh, it's, it's so reminiscent of what it was in Jesus' day. There are eight gates into those old walls that go into the old city. Seven of those gates are open. You can go into them. The uh, eighth gate, which is the eastern gate, the beautiful eastern gate, is not open because it's full of cement. As I've told you before, when the Turks took over uh, Palestine uh, hundreds of years ago, they were determined that Jesus, the Messiah, would not come back as Zechariah said he would. He is not going to do it and will stop him. He thinks he's going to come down on the Mount of Olives and come traipsing through the Eastern Gate. That ain't going to happen, they said. So they filled that gate full of cement, which will really stop Jesus when he <laughs> comes back. But uh, as we open up this little video tonight, we're going to be inside the old walls. I mentioned on here that when you're in the new part of the city, it's like being in any city in the world. Once you go through one of those seven open gates, you go back in time 2,000 years. And we're going to start on the Via Dolorosa. We're going to go into the, uh, the uh, old forum where Pilate used to have hold court. If you saw The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's film, you know where Jesus was beaten so severely 
you can still stand on the exact paving area where that took place. It won't look the same because it's no longer open. There's a building on top of it. Uh, the Daughters of Zion have a, have a convent there. God bless them. They have preserved this area beautifully for us. But you can still stand on those same paving stones and walk out into the open on the same road that Jesus carried his cross. It opens out on the Via Dolorosa, which we will follow. It's an interesting street. All the streets inside the old city are interesting because it's a maze of roads. And uh, I love to go in there and just browse and to shop, and I love to eat in there. And um, it's wonderful. And you see people from every nation of the world. It's crowded little streets. You'll see that. And then we'll come out through the Damascus Gate, and then I'm going to take you briefly over to Mount, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended back into the Father's presence, and then we'll get started right into the book of Acts. So Rusty or Frank or whoever's up there, if you'd Crank up the movie. Here we go. Here we now go. on the uh, Via Dolorosa, and uh, here's the Eke Homo Arch, and we're going into what used to be the, uh, the Judgment Hall, Pilate's Judgment Hall in uh, the Antonia Fortress. Very rare to find the streets this empty. It's wonderful. We're just slightly above where we were underneath in the tunnel. This is another one of those cisterns that uh, serviced uh, the Antonia Fortress. I'm down on the stone paving of uh, Pontius Pilate's Judgment Hall. This is where Jesus was beaten so savagely that we see in the Mel Gibson picture. We have to remember, of course, that this courtyard was outside. Now it has buildings over the top of it. So this paving was exposed to the sun. Somewhere in here in this courtyard were whipping posts. Jesus was tied to one of these posts and beaten, as we saw in the uh, Gibson film. And then somewhere over here, and here's where the road starts, the old ancient Roman road. Somewhere along in here, the cross was fitted to Jesus. And he began the long trek to Calvary. This is the old street that leads out of Pilate's Judgment Hall. And here's this beautiful mosaic art of Jesus taking the cross. You're on the Via Dolorosa now, packed with people always. We're at the first station of the Via Dolorosa here. Having just come out of the uh, Lithostratus, the paving of the uh, Antonia Fortress. These are what we call the border police. They belong to the police, so there is something between military and police. They are highly trained to in the situation. You get every kind of a sound in the world, every kind of a language you can imagine. I cannot provide the aromas for you on this video, but for the most part, they're pretty good. Just imagine Jesus taking the cross down through here. I 
think you're at Battlefield Mall here, Tito? Hey, this is great mall. This is the back side of the Damascus Gate. Is this the gate that Jesus would have carried the cross out of? Well, not this exact gate, but it could have been this one here. Leading north out of the city to Calvary. And the famed Damascus Gate. David has our group right over here giving a little lecture. The crowds haven't come yet. When you go through that gate, you go back 2,000 years in time. One of the eight gates of the city, seven of which are open. The Damascus Gate. If Jesus came out of this area, this gate, Calvary, is this right over there, between those two buildings. Now Wednesday morning and our first full day of touring here in Israel. Darlene's going to rest up today. She's kind of tired from last night. And uh, our folks are gathered for their first full day of touring as soon as the bus comes. We're at our beautiful Sheraton Mariah here in Jerusalem. Folks eagerly awaiting the arrival of the bus. Look at this people, they're all ready to go. Yeah. Here comes Egal. Our wheels have arrived. This is a new street that's just been cut through on the way up to the Mount of Olives and it affords a rather marvelous view here of Jerusalem. The old Hyatt Hotel is just behind me over there. Eastern Wall, the Eastern Gate. We're on top of the Mount of Olives getting ready for our picture. This is my friend Ali and his camel, his old camel Kojak died, the one we used on Byline. So there she goes. I hold silver or whatever. There is Pastor Dan getting on the camel. He's ready to take the trip. Yay! There he goes. There he goes, Pastor Dan. With Ali and the camel. Kojak! We come tonight to the book of Acts, and I just wanted to show you that because it helps you to understand a little bit of the time and the culture, and that's so vital in understanding the Word. Those of you who have been going to church here for a long time will know that there was a great turning point in my life and ministry here about 10 years ago. And <clears throat> it began when the Holy Spirit told me to read the greatest church growth book that was ever written. I have every church growth book I think that's ever come off the presses. There's one out now that is so good, it's just absolutely breathtaking, and you ought to read it. In fact, if you're here tonight, you are going to read it. It's the book of Acts. If we would follow the book of Acts, we would impact the world.
It's the pattern book. And the Holy Spirit instructed me to read through the book of Acts in its entirety every week for a year. That's no big deal. You can do it in a few minutes a day. But it's the constant hammering of the word into you that, that impacts you. If you just read it through one time, then you've read it. But it, it's that constant week by week hammering into you that changes you so much. And as I was reading through the book of Acts, it reminded me of a great story of one of the early Asbarians, H.C. Morrison. I've told you this story before, but I must tell it to you again because it's so vital as we start this study tonight. H.C. Um, Morrison grew up as a little kid, a rural kid. His parents had no money. <clears throat> and. Um, they lived out in the farm somewhere, and one day H.C. was in town to get some supplies for his dad. This was back around 1900, 1910, something like that. And he saw a big multicolored sign on a, on a window there. It said the circus was coming to town, and it showed pictures of clowns and lions and tigers and so forth. It cost 25 cents to get in. And and H.C. had never seen anything like that in his whole life. This little kid, you can just see his eyes popping out. So he got back home and he said to his dad, can I go to the circus? And his dad said, certainly. If you can get the quarter, you can go. Well, times were really tough back then. You know, a quarter was a lot of money. And so H.C. began to work. He did all the chores for his dad. Then he'd go from farm to farm and say, can I do any, any kind of a chore? You give me a penny. Just help me. Things have changed, haven't they? And in two or three weeks' time, he'd accumulated 25 cents, which he took to the bank, got a shiny quarter for it. He could not wait for the circus to come to town. And he wrote that the day that it was coming in town, he rode into town on a horse and tethered the horse somewhere. He joined the hundreds and hundreds of people who were down by the train station, because back in those days, you had these circus trains. And way down the track, they could see that train coming in, laboring into the depot, just chugging away in this black smoke going into the sky. And it pulled in with screeching brakes, and people were so excited. And one by one, the various boxcars started to open, and boy, out came clowns. Oh, were they funny. And H.C. just laughed. And Pretty soon they started to unload the elephants. He had never seen an elephant. Here come great big old elephants, trunk to tail. Wow. Then they unloaded these huge crates that had cages in them with lions and, and orangutans and gorillas and, and leopards. And here came all the acrobats and the band, little band of four or five guys starting to play. Da, 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 da. And the people, it was so exciting. And H.C. said, on both sides of the street, people lined up, and here comes the circus, and the acrobats were doing stuff, and the tumblers and the lions were roaring, and the elephants just making a mess. And he said, it was incredible. He said, I was so glad I'd worked for that quarter. And then it was over, and they all disappeared in the big tent down at the end of the street. And it dawned on me I hadn't paid my quarter to anybody, and I said to a man next to me, who do I... Pay. And the man said, I'll take your quarter. And he took my quarter and I went home. I told my dad all about it. It was so exciting. It was years later when somebody explained to me, I'd never seen the circus at all. All I'd ever seen was a parade. And as I read through the book of Acts week after week for a solid year, that story came back to me so strongly. I've been in Pentecost all my life. And I've seen some wonderful things. But when you read the book of Acts and you understand that that is the pattern book, that is the historic pattern book for the church, it hits me like a ton of bricks. I haven't seen the main event yet. I've only seen the parade. I really believe with all of my heart that First Assembly is well on its way to going through the flaps of that tent. I really believe it. I believe our direction is right. I believe our motivation is right. Because 
we don't follow some other resource. We follow what the book says. The book of Acts is the story of two cities. It's the story of Jerusalem and it's the story of Antioch. It's the story of two disciples, Peter and Paul. It's the story of two churches, the church at Jerusalem and the church at Antioch. The church at Jerusalem wasn't worth the powder to blow it up. It was the church at Antioch that shook the whole world. It was out of the church at Antioch where Barnabas, one of the great unsung heroes of the faith, pastored for so many years. It was out of that church that this young associate guy whom the church had cast off and sent him back to Turkey, a guy named Saul of Tarsus. Barnabas saw in him the genius that he was and began to nurture him. He becomes Paul the apostle. And then we read that the Holy Spirit comes into a service in that first assembly there in Antioch one day and separated Barnabas and Paul and they become the first missionaries ever known to the human race following what Jesus had told them to do decades earlier go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature everybody on TV today and Christian TV wants to say we got a new message for you a new revelation I don't believe that but I believe what Reinhard Bonnke said to us the other day, God has told us to take the gospel to the whole world. He's told us that over and over again, and he's just probably not going to say anything else to us until we do that. And I believe that with all of my heart. The book of Acts gets you pointed in the right direction again. The book of Acts gets you to see the right picture of what it should be. I was talking to our missionary, the standard before the service. Been itinerating for a year. 20% of his budget is in. What in the world kind of Pentecostal churches has he gone to? Harvest means Pentecost. Pentecost means harvest. For a missionary in the assemblies of God to itinerate with all of his heart for a year in harvest-minded Pentecostal, we're the book of Acts, we're Pentecostal. I don't believe it. Now, why do these missionaries have to struggle so hard? I'm not sure if this is anointing or irritation. Yeah, both. Let's take a look at page one. The book of Acts, <clears throat> line seven, is the pattern book for the church. This is what we're supposed to be. It's the story of Pentecost, the harvest. It's the history of the early church without which we would know precious little about Paul or why he wrote the epistles. If you read Corinthians and we didn't have the book of Acts, you'd have no comprehension why Paul was even writing to those people. But we have the book of Acts, which is the history. It's followed by these books called the epistles, whom I've told you many times were not wives of the apostles. <laughs> the epistles mean simply letter, a letter. Paul established the church in Corinth, Greece. We read about that in the book of Acts in great detail. Later on, he writes back to the church at Corinth to help them, to encourage them, to correct some problems. First and second Corinthians. We learn about the background of that in the book of Acts. Someone has said that Acts is the bridge between the four gospels and the epistles. Boy, that's good. I don't know who said that, but I'm glad he did or she did. As Pastor Dave indicated in his prayer, it, the book of Acts is an incomplete book as there is no finish to it. Every other book has a finish to it, pretty much. Not the book of Acts. We get to the end of the writing in chapter 28 and it just stops. We don't even know about Paul's mission to, when he gets to Nero. It doesn't even tell us. It just stops. Well, is that a problem? No, the Holy Spirit gave us the book of Acts. It means that you and I are to be living in the incomplete continuum of the book of Acts. I have to kind of smile sometimes when I hear some of our brothers and sisters on television who are not Pentecostal patiently explaining to us why the ministry of the Holy Spirit isn't for us anymore. 
They explain it away in great detail. And my question to them is then, why are there one half billion Christians in the world who are Pentecostal? Why is it the fastest growing religious phenomenon in the world? It's growing faster than Islam. And we don't even kill people. I have to wonder about Islam, pardon this little parenthesis here, but this poor guy over in Afghanistan they wanted to kill because he had converted to Christianity. And one of the great mullahs, the pastors, preachers there in Afghanistan said, we'll catch him and we'll tear him apart piece by piece. You have to wonder how insecure these poor people really are, that they have to defend their faith with swords and guns and threats and bombs. Boy, they must be insecure. The gospel is come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. The gospel is the truth of the mind. It's the mind, let the mind that is in Christ Jesus be in me. Uh, the book of Acts is the church's introduction to world missions. Uh, go down to the box, line 24, the theme or the key to the book of Acts is Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power. Ye shall receive power. I wonder if Jesus meant that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you receive power. There ought to be an enormous difference in spirit-baptized believers and non-spirit-baptized believers. I'm praying that hundreds of people receive the baptism yet this year at First Assembly, praying toward it, working toward it. We're going to see that because you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, please listen to me extremely carefully. In the assemblies of God, we have 16 doctrines of faith. I believe in them passionately, fully to the complete extent. The way we emphasize them sometimes, I think gets off track. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the initial, the first physical, say physical, evidence of the baptism is speaking in other tongues. The initial and continuing spiritual evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is power. I'm just going to level with you. Most of our churches don't have enough power to blow their nose. And yet they claim so much. Oh, if Billy Graham had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I just want to kick him right through the goalposts of heaven. <laughs> the spiritual impact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is power. It is the divine ability, the supernatural capacity to do what you can not do in your own power. So that if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you are confronted with a task and you say, I can't do that, something's wrong. Paul, great apostle said, I can do all things through Christ. I really feel strong about this more so tonight than usual because I was in a committee meeting all day Monday when I was told a thousand reasons why I can't do anything. I'm not that saved to go to those meetings. My Baptist brethren can go because they're eternally secure. I ain't. Ye shall receive power to do what? To be my witnesses. Being a witness is not something you learn. God bless those who subscribe to the four spiritual laws and the Roman road and all of those little tools, but that's not what impacts anybody. 
Do you think when you approach somebody who's not saved and you pull out one of these tools, Satan says, oh, oh, we're dead with this guy. He knows the Roman road. What scares the wits out of the devil is the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in you that causes out of your innermost being to flow rivers of living water so that you are really communicating with that person one-on-one, -on -one, not reciting something you learned in class somewhere. The great joy of witnessing. I've been on planes when, and I'm, I'm not good on planes because I sleep. I go to, the only place in the world where I can really sleep is an airplane. And, and the Holy Spirit will wake me up and say, I want you to witness to somebody. And then the door will open. You don't have to jam it open, just be alert. Just be listening and you walk through that door. It's not something you even are prepared to do. The Holy Spirit says, here's this person. Witness to this person. And the doors are there, and you begin to relate. You listen. Good witnesses are, first of all, great listeners. Great listeners and responders. The Holy Spirit enables us to respond to that person. And sometimes... And sometimes it takes on a supernatural element that's scary. I sat down, oh dear Jesus, I sat down with a guy one day in a plane. This guy was huge. He's about 6'4". I mean, he worked out with the weights, this guy. And wore the kind of a shirt that showed you that he did. And I didn't pay much attention. I read a little book and I'm starting to go to sleep. And, and uh, the Holy Spirit woke me up and we started talking. He says, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor of a church. Oh, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, I have a problem. And the Holy Spirit had me say to this guy, yeah, I know you do, you're gay. Don't ever say that to a... <laughs> and the guy started to cry. He said, my life is a living hell. You know, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going up to a weightlifter and say, I think you're gay. No, 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 no. My mama did not raise a moron. <laughs> now, it doesn't always take that tack. Sometimes it's just a logical progression of thought, but the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do that, and it's with confidence. You say, well, I can't lead anybody to Christ. Of course you can't. Nobody ever said you could. Only the Holy Spirit can draw anyone to Christ. Let's suppose you're a farmer and you're going out and plant corn. You plant the corn. Can you make it grow? I don't think so. It needs rain. It needs the sun. It needs fertile soil. All you do is put the corn in the ground. That's all a witness does is plant seed. There's no pressure in planting a seed. And then it's the Holy Spirit's problem, not mine. My problem is to be a faithful witness. You shall receive power. Boy, I didn't want to get hung up on that, but I did, didn't I? Little brief outline there in, verse, in the lines 25 through 27. Chapters 1 to 7 have to do with the church in Jerusalem, not a model. Chapters 8 to 12 tell of the harvest in Judea and Samaria, led by some tremendous people like Philip and, and Barnabas. Chapters 13 to 28 tell of the work of the Holy Spirit into the uttermost part of the world. Book is written by Luke. I don't want to get going into that too much. Go to page two. You'll see the material on Luke there at the top of the page. Go down to line 29. C.H. Turner's outline of the book of Acts. This is really the best outline I think I've found. At least I like it. And if you have a good outline in front of you, it will help you. Be, you know, the Bible is given, the Word of God is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Chapter and verse headings aren't. Do you understand that? They're man-made things that were put in there. And they can really bollocks you up when you're reading the Word. So if you have a good outline and a progression of where the book is taking you, it helps you to read it. Acts 1, 1 to 6, 7 tells of the church in Jerusalem and the preaching of Peter. And you have this little synopsis. The word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. 
Acts 6, 8 to verse to chapter 9, 31 describes the spread of Christianity through Israel and the martyrdom of Stephen, followed by the preaching in Samaria. Here's the summation. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it was multiplied. Number three, Acts 9.32 to 12.24 includes the conversion of Paul, the extension of the church to Antioch, and the reception of Cornelius the Gentile into the church by Peter. The summation again, the word of God grew and multiplied. I guess one of the reasons I love King James so much is it keeps using this word multiplied, multiplied. That's the arithmetic with the Holy Spirit is multiplied. Man, when you get to Madagascar, it's going to explode. has to because the word of God is going to grow. No wonder Satan doesn't want to get you there. The word of God causes multiplication of people. You saw the screen last Sunday morning with Reinhardt preaching. That was one of the smaller crowds, 1.2 million. Think of the 1.6 million. Did you ever see crowds like that in your life? I didn't hear anybody say, well, you know, he must be using trickery. Lord can't be in that. He must not be preaching the gospel. Reinhard Bonnke is so right wing, he makes Genghis Khan look like Hugh Hefner. And people come because the word of God multiplies, multiplies. Uh, number four, Acts 12, 25 to 16, 5 tells of the extension of the church through Asia Minor. Asia Minor is Turkey. It's not China or Korea. It's Turkey back in those days. Look at the summation. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. We had 50 Assemblies of God churches in Florida last year that did not have one convert. Explain that to me. Uh, Acts 16:6 6 to 1920 relates the extension of the church to Europe and the work of Paul in great Gentile cities such as Corinth and Ephesus. Oh man, what he did there. So the word of God grew and prevailed mightily. Acts 19:21 to the end of the book tells of Paul's arrival and his imprisonment there. Now high points in the book of Acts, <laughs> every one of them is, but let's just touch on a few. <laughs> to encourage you in your reading. I, I want you to read the book of Acts over and over and over again. First of all, the ascension. I showed you the Mount of Olives, which is on the eastern side of the old city of Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives are separated by the Kidron Valley, which is pretty deep today, but back in Jesus' day, it was much deeper than that. Because when the Romans came in in 70 AD and destroyed the city under Titus, they leveled the city and much of the debris of Jerusalem just rolled down into that deep canyon and filled it up, it was never removed. The ascension of Jesus, when he had spoken these things, Jesus speaking, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now this is important to you because what you read here in these three verses is reversed exactly reversed at the second coming of Christ. It's like a movie. Here's the Mount of Olives. Jesus is talking. Suddenly he's taken up and a cloud receives him out of his sight. Now play the movie backwards. Jesus comes back through the cloud and comes back to the same spot because that's what's going to happen at the second coming. It's not the rapture. The rapture is when we meet the Lord in the air. The second coming is after the judgment seat of Christ, when rewards will be distributed if we have any, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The meantime down on earth is the great tribulation. Then Jesus says, I love this, mount up, and <laughs> we're going back. And we come right back, that's the second coming, when Jesus literally sets foot once again on the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah said the Mount of Olives will split in two, from north to south, causing a vast chasm east to west, going right down to the Dead Sea. You know, this is such a fascinating thing. The Dead Sea is dead, dead, dead. It's called the Dead Sea because it's dead. Nothing comes out of it. Water pours into it. 
and not even much of that anymore because both the Jordanians and the Israelis use the water coming out of the Jordan, which flows to the Sea of Galilee, for irrigation, and rightly so. So there's not a lot of water going into the Dead Sea, and besides they're mining the Dead Sea for phosphate, and I suppose it's gone down from where we used to go, darling, first time we went over there in 1971, I bet it's receded down in the valley a half mile, maybe more than that. Uh, what was I going to tell you? Yeah, it's the trouble to getting old and having these. What was I talking about, Ed? Dead Sea. Yeah, but what? What? Why was I talking? About? Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Senior moment. I get, you know, my mind just is going in so many ways. The Dead Sea is dead. <laughs> But it's not always going to be dead. Ezekiel talks about the time when the Dead Sea will come to life. The same fish you would catch in the Mediterranean Sea, you would now catch in the Dead Sea. There are no fish in the Dead Sea. So there's going to be some kind of a connector there. And now we read in Zechariah that when Jesus comes, the second coming, just the reverse of Acts 1 here, rewind the film, come back down through the clouds, it comes right back to the same spot on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two, north to south, so that from east to west there's this chasm. So that for the first time, Jerusalem becomes a port city because it'll be on the Dead Sea. It'll have access to the Dead Sea, which is going to be connected and if it hadn't been for the end of Fada, it already would be by the Dead Med Canal. You know where they were going to connect the Dead Med Canal? And in Getty. So what? That's where Ezekiel, 2,600 years ago, wrote it would come. Man, you think this book isn't divine? That kind of pinpoint prophetic truth. So boy, did I get off on that one. Thank you for saving my life. The Ascension. Secondly, uh, Pentecost, line 33. Acts 2, 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That place was on Mount Zion, on the south end of Jerusalem. They were in the home of John Mark, his mother, his mother owned this house. Must have been a great house with several levels. We call them split levels, you know, because Pentecost fell in the upper room. The Last Supper was in that same room, the upper room, a higher level home. So they're up there. They've been praying now for 10 days. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Pentecost means 50. Penta means 50. And then 50 days after Passover came Pentecost, which was the annual Jewish day of harvest. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of harvest. Pentecost means harvest. Pentecost does not mean speaking in tongues. Yes, we believe in speaking in tongues. We believe it's the initial physical evidence of the baptism. But the fact that you speak in tongues does not mean you're Pentecostal means you may have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But Pentecostal people are harvesters. You cannot have it both ways. Just can't. I remember where I was. Don't, get, don't panic here. Suddenly, top of page four, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It does not say it was a rushing mighty wind. It said it sounded like one. It's like when you, if you've ever been in a tornado, I've been in two of them. They say tornadoes sound like a non-rushing freight train. They do, boy, I'm telling you. They don't say the tornado is a freight train. They say it just sounds like one. So whatever it was that filled the upper room sounded like this great wind. Filled all the house where they were, what's the verb? My favorite verb in the world, sitting. I love to sit. 
Most Pentecostal churches insist that you stand, and when I go there, I correct them. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was poured out initially when the people were sitting. If you want a revival, I tell them, sit down. There appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire. It didn't say it was fire, it said it was like fire, set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was the fuel that went in the tank of the rocket for global evangelization, purely and simply. Jesus said, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and ye shall be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Fort Myers, Judea, Lee County, Samaria, Florida, and the uttermost part of the world. Ye shall be my witnesses. That's what it says. And he gave us this rocket fuel, the Holy Spirit, to make it happen. I'm just about to get excited. The book of Acts changes the way you think, people. One of the third, the third highlight that I put here on line nine, the supernatural in the ministry of the apostles. This is the text, Darlene, that I used at Ocean Grove a couple years ago, this great Methodist enclave in New Jersey, where, I mean, it's high church. I've told some of you this story before. I mean, it's high church. I've been there four summers and every year they hook you up with an entertainer. The entertainers are there on Saturday night and then you're there all day Sunday. And last year when I was there, the entertainers were the Smothers Brothers, Dickie and Tommy Smothers. Nice guys, but they didn't have a clue what I was talking about. I mean, and then church on Sunday morning is high church. They have the third biggest pipe organ in the Western Hemisphere. They have not a big choir, maybe 80 voices, 60 voices. Not a big choir, but they're all trained voices. And the lead voice in every section is a regular at the Metropolitan Opera. When you come in, they give you a menu, a bulletin, and God help you if you break away from that. It tells you when to stand, there's an asterisk. Two asterisks, sit out. And they mean it. And it's high church. So on this time, I'm telling you about the bishop of the church is introducing me. And we have here today a pastor of a church in Florida. He never says what church it is. Of a church in Florida who will speak to us from the word right after we hear this song from the choir. He sits down right beside me. So the organist is sitting right behind me, his back, you know how they do at the back. And then here's the choir. And he starts to play, and they're doing Schubert's The Omnipotence. Oh, oh, oh. He starts off, and that organ, this guy can make this organ dance. He, oh, plays that thing. And all the bellows are underneath where I'm standing, and I feel the platform shake. And they start to sing these incredible trained voices. God created the world. Pum, 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 pum. And the lightning flashed. It's terrific. And I'm sitting there listening to this, and I got anointed. I got to thinking about how great God was. Because he is. Because he is. Because he is. And I started to cry. And you know me, I don't cry very often. I started to cry. And I'm praying as they're singing. It's so moving to me. Oh, God, you're so great. And the Holy Spirit says to me, if I'm so great, why are you going to preach this little Mickey Mouse canned sermon when they get done singing? And I remember saying, well, These aren't Pentecostal people. <laughs> Holy Spirit said, well, I am. Do what I tell you. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, preach on divine healing. 
there anybody else up there? <laughs> and I, I remember praying, Lord, I don't even have a sermon on divine healing, you know, that I can just... Lord said, I know. You just get up there, and I'll take it from there. I've never done that in my life. I know there are a lot of young Pentecostal guys who say, just get up there and open your mouth, and the Lord will fill it, only if he's in the baloney business. <laughs> Study to show yourself. You never go in the pulpit unprepared. Never. Except this time. So they finish singing, and they never applaud. I mean, it's so quiet in there. The dead are happy in there. If the rapture takes place, they're out of there. The dead in Christ rise first. So it's absolute silence. And I got up and uh, I said, that song has moved me to my toes because God is so great. See, this is this power of Acts 2, 4, that out of your innermost being will flow rivers. And I said, while they have been ministering to you in song, the Holy Spirit's been ministering to me and told me to preach to you this morning about divine healing. And behind me, the bishop goes, Ugh. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to preach to you very long, maybe 15 minutes, and I'm going to do something I've never done in my whole life, ever. I don't think I've ever done it since. I'm going to have a healing line. And the bishop's going. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that. I mean, just like Earl Roberts used to do, you know. I used to watch him when I was a kid go to those great tents. And, man, we saw tremendous things happen. And this was the text, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It's on page 4, line 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And I asked you, I asked the people, how many of you have seen supernatural things in your church, in God's church? It's his house. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you have seen miracles in your church, in your family? And of the rest, nurse no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them, and the believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitude, see, there it is again, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on the beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There have been folks who've taken that to mean some great godly man, just his shadow would heal you. That's not what it says. Since their faith was so strong, they wanted to get so close to these men and women of God that even the shadow of them as the sun came by, would, they'd be so close the shadow would hit. Shadow's not going to heal them. There came a multitude, there it is again, out of the cities, clear down in Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed, every one. And I just preached a simple little message on divine healing. I said, now I'm going to pray for the sick. Might not, may not be anybody who wants to come forward and be prayed for. But if you do, I'll pray for you. And I turned to the organist and I said, do you know the old song that used to be Earl Roberts' theme song, Where the Healing Waters Flow? Any of you know that song? Where the healing waters flow, where the joys celestial glow. Oh, there's peace and rest and love where the healing waters flow. And I asked this guy who knew that song. He said, yes. I try to tell worship leaders, people are, want to hear these great anthems of the church. Well, you know. So the guy says, yes, I know it. And he cranks up that big organ, starts to play. And the choir members said, we know that song. We remember that. And they start to sing, only it comes out, where the healing waters flow. <laughs> Holy Spirit's a hoot, man. They start to sing this song. And I just walked down in front and said, if you're sick, come up, I'll pray for you. One hour and 15 minutes, I prayed for sick people. And I told you that, in, uh, that one, one of the ladies came forward and she said, I'm having my leg amputated Tuesday. I have a massive cancer on the back of my leg. Pray for me. I prayed for her. 
And she turned around, no big theatrics. You know, I can't do like Benny Hinn. Touch! Wish I could. Wish I could throw something they just fall down. Nobody falls down when I pray for them. And I just prayed for her, and she turned around, walked down this aisle, and she got back about halfway, and she turned around screaming. She touched her leg, and she said, that growth is gone. <laughs> last year when I was there, a man came up. Darlene was with me last year, and this man comes up to me, and he said, do you remember that healing service? I said, yeah. He said, I came and asked you to pray for me. I had an inoperable brain tumor, cancer, that was killing me. Doctors said they didn't even dare think about operating. He said, you just prayed a simple little prayer, because that's the only prayer I know how to pray. I don't know theatrical prayers. God bless those that do, but I don't. I'm just a climbing hill Iowa boy. He said, you prayed for me. He said, that was several years ago. I'm absolutely well healed, delivered from that brain cancer. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that's number five, the supernatural in the ministry. Then get down to line 25, number four, the first martyr and major persecution of the church starts. That was, of course, Stephen. And moving over to page five, that, that uh, persecution, Satan is not, don't over, don't underestimate him, but for goodness sakes, don't overestimate him. He is not divine. He is not the great arch enemy of God. God says, and he goes spinning into space. We're not even talking about the same thing. Satan is not divine. He is a created being. God created him as an angel. He proved false. But he doesn't have all of these powers. Have you seen the, what's the movie where they delivered the devil out of the, the exorcist? Have you seen the exorcist where the head spun around and they spit green pea soup out? Good grief, no. Do you feel the presence of Satan in this place? Oh. But don't underestimate him either. But don't overestimate him. Satan is not clever. And this passage right here, uh, passage Acts 11, uh, Acts, uh, no, that's not it. Where did it go? Back up to page four there. Acts 7, 54 to verse 60 is the persecution and the martyrdom of Stephen. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Because what the persecution did was fan out these spirit-filled saints. No longer are they harbored inside Jerusalem. All of a sudden now, they're up north. They're in Phoenicia. They're in Lebanon. All of a sudden now they're over here in Cyprus. All of a sudden now they're fanning down into Alexandria, Egypt, and every place they go, they take the fire of God with them. So the persecution which Satan meant to destroy Christianity fanned the flame. And Stephen's the first missionary to die. And I'll have to wrap this up with uh, page five, the conversion of Paul. One of the things that I love to do when we take trips to Israel, such as we'll do, Lord willing, in a couple months again, we'll take the folks up on Mount Hermon, which is the great mountain in the north part of Israel that separates Egypt from Lebanon, as it separates Israel from Lebanon and Syria. It's a high mountain. It's about 95, 9,600 feet high, which for the Middle East is a high mountain. Much of the year, it's got snow on it. The snows melt, they form rivulets down Mount Hermon, and they form the tributary for the Jordan River. That's where you get started. So we like to go up there, it's fun. And on a clear day, on a clear day, see there goes that five second thing again. On a clear day, you can see forever and ever. <laughs> That's terrible, that's terrible. 
on a clear day, you can see the outskirts of Damascus, Syria, huge city. It's about 25 or 30 miles up there. And we stand there on this plateau at maybe seven, 8,000 feet, and you look out over this prairie, and there's the outskirts to Damascus. And cutting right through the fields is a road. It bypasses a couple little towns. And this road makes its way all the way down to the east of where we're standing. Then it curves back into the south and goes all the way down to Jerusalem. It's the Damascus Road. And that's the road Paul was on, Saul. Breathing out threatenings. Look, look at that first verse, page five there, line 10. And Saul, comma, yet breathing. He had overseen the persecution of and the death of Stephen. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings, but that wasn't all, and slaughter. That's a nasty word, slaughter. Before he got saved, Saul slaughtered Christians against the disciples of the Lord. Now he's on his way to Damascus. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. How many of you think he fell off his horse when the light hit? Good. Because <laughs> he didn't. We don't think he had a horse. You think he was walking. Everybody, will, they read it into it. You know, he fell off his horse. Well, it doesn't say he fell off his horse, you know. The only person we know who really had a horse was, of course, Isaiah. Right? And the name of Isaiah's horse was Ismi. Many times he said, whoa, Ismi. <laughs> Just want to see if you're listening. Okay, final word. Oh man, I wanted to get into Barnabas. I didn't even get to Barnabas. But you can read these notes. Uh, look at page six, line seven. Nothing so epitomized Paul in life as the way he left it. Second Timothy four, six to eight. I'm ready to be offered. He's gonna have his head cut off. I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. You talk about nonchalance. Uh, my plane leaves at uh, 2.45. I've fought a good fight. See, a lot of people stop fighting before they die. Don't stop. I finished the course. I started it, and I finished it. I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Not to me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. That's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. You might want to write in your margin 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, I want to talk about Barnabas. I love Barnabas. I love Barney. Not Fife, but I love Barney Fife too, but this Barney. When you, when you read the book of Acts, pay attention to Barnabas. If it had not been for Barnabas, the gospel never would have got out of Israel, probably. If it hadn't been for Barnabas, you'd have never heard of the apostle Paul because the saints there in Jerusalem didn't like him. They didn't like him. He was different. Boy, was he ever different. If you can get it, go to, go get online and go to eBay or someplace, or maybe you can get it at Blockbuster or, or Best Buy or Circuit City or somewhere in the video department. About 25 years ago, uh, CBS did a series, a mini-series, called Peter and Paul. And uh, it's beyond brilliant. Get it if you can. It's faithful to the word. The production is immaculate, and it'll make the book of Acts come alive. Peter and Paul, I know it's out in DVD, if you can just find it and get it or order it from somebody. But you need to see that. That's, that's incredible.
I'm sorry I kept you so late. Let's stand.